Chapter Three of Etiquette and Espionage: How Not to Make Introductions. The coachman finally regained his sentence, realizing this was not some nightmare. There really was a fourteen-year-old girl with mousy hair and a serious expression driving his carriage. He yanked the reins away from Sophronia and pulled the horses up short. They hung their heads, sides heaving. Well then, said Sophronia to the coachman, sticking her nose in the air. She jumped down. A series of cries and wails emanated from inside the carriage. She opened the door to find Pillover sitting and reading his book while his sister lay in a crumpled heap on the floor. He gestured with his chin at Dimity. She was shot. He sounded remarkably unconcerned for a brother with any degree of affection for his sibling. Good Lord. Sophronia jumped in to see to her new friend's health. The bullet had grazed Dimity's shoulder. It had ripped her dress and left a partly burned gash behind, but didn't look all that bad. Sophronia checked to make certain Dimity had no other injuries. Then she sat back on her heels. Is that all? I've had worse scrapes from drinking tea. Why has she come over all crumpled? Pillover rolled his eyes. Faints at the sight of blood, our Dimity always has weak nerves, father says. It doesn't even have to be her blood. Sophronia snorted. Exactly, and the smelling salts were in her suitcase, which is now some distance behind us. Leave her be, she'll come round eventually. Sophronia turned her attention to the source of the whales. What's wrong with her, then? Is Mademoiselle Geraldine also injured? The headmistress was curled into a ball, hands covering her face, whimpering. Pillover was as disgusted with the headmistress as he was with his sister. She's been like that ever since we pulled her inside. Nothing damaged except her brain, so far as I can de determine. Sophronia looked closer and caught the headmistress watching them slyly from behind her hands. She was shamming. But why? So she doesn't have to explain anything. Such a peculiar woman. That it was then that Sophronia noticed that Pillover was also looking unwell behind his sneer. She turned her full attention on the boy. And are you quite all right, Mr. Pillover? I'm not a very good traveler at the best of times, Miss Sophronia. You might have taken that last half mile a little smoother. Sophronia tried to hide a smile. I might, but what pleasure would there be in that? Oh, wonderful, said Pillover. You're one of those kind of girls. Sophronia narrowed her eyes. You could ride on the box next to the coachman. Fresh air would do you a world of good. Pillover looked most offended. Outside like a peasant? I think not. Sophronia shrugged. Suited me. Pillover gave her a look that suggested that her valiant rescue was no excuse and that she was, in fact, now quite low class in his eyes. Sophronia t returned her attention to the whimpering headmistress. What are we going to do about her? And then more directly, you're not fooling anyone, you realize. And Pillover evidently had been fooled. She's shaman? Well, there's nothing we can do about her. The coachman knows where to go. He can get us to Bunsen's. Someone there will know what to do. Sophronia nodded and stuck her head out the carriage window. Coachman? Yes, little miss? The man looked generally upset with life. You can drive us on to the Bunsen's locale, can't you? Yes, little miss, I know the school, but I'm not convinced I intend to continue on now. Never been held up by flyway men before. Bugger it, how would Mumsy handle this? Sophronia looked the coachman full in the face and straightened her spine as stiff as she could. You will if you wish to be paid. Keep a decent pace and an eye on the sky and it shouldn't happen again. The moment she said it, Sophronia became completely shocked by her own daring. She was also mildly impressed by how imperious she sounded. So was the coachman, apparently, because he resumed his post without another word and set the horses a sedate trot. Pillover glanced over the top of his glasses. You do that rather well, don't you? What? Order other people around. I've not yet got the way of it myself. And Sophronia rather thought Pillover was regardless doing pretty well at snobbery for a grubby boy. She was about to say something of the kind when Mademoiselle Geraldine's whimpering escalated. Oh, do stop it and explain yourself, Sophronia ordered feeling she was on an autocratic streak. 
to her surprise, the headmistress listened, transforming her simulated, whispering into outright ire directed at Sophronia. I didn't attend for this, you understand, easy assignment, they said. She noted with interest that Mademoiselle Geraldine had lost her French accent. Nothing to it but improvisational theatrics, some on-point assessment of new candidates, simply act older, put on a bit of an accent and a pretty dress. Such an easy finishing. Others should be so lucky. You're certain to make it through. But no, oh no, I have to, ha to have a combination retrieval and recruitment undertaking with an unexpected attack from unknown counterintelligence, sir, elements, and, and no second. How did they send me on without a second? Me? I mean, did I ask for this? I didn't ask for this. Who needs active status? I don't need active status. This is ridiculous. She seemed to be progressively building herself up to sublime self-righteousness. Sophronia felt that there was something else undercutting the flood of words. Headmistress, is there nothing we can do for you? You seem upset. Upset? Of course I'm upset. And don't call me headmistress. Headmistress, my ruddy turnip. Sophronia gra gasped at the shocking word. Now that's taking matters too far. Mademoiselle Geraldine sat up straight and glared as though Sophronia were responsible for everything bad in the world. My face hurts, my dress is in tatters, and I have no slippers. This last and deepest offense was uttered in a positive wail. Then you're not our headmistress? How could I be? I'm only 17 years old. You can't possibly think I'm the headmistress of a finishing school. You're not that naive, but isn't that what we were meant to think? I didn't think about you at all, muttered Pillover, returning to his book. Who are you, then? asked Sophronia. I'm Miss Monique de Palouse. She paused as though expecting the name to produce some sign of recognition. Sophronia merely gave her a blank look. So this begs the question, where is the real Mademoiselle Geraldine? Oh, Monique waved a hand in the air and sniffed. She never leaves much anymore, and she's useless when she does. They always send impersonators. They do? Of course they do. It's easier and a good way to finish. And who is they? Why, the teachers, of course. But we were talking about me and my problems. Sophronia looked up at Monique up and down gravely. I don't think we're going to solve those in the space of one carriage ride. Pillover tut tutted at her from behind his book, but there was clear amusement in the reprimand. Monique sneered. Who do you think you are, covert recruit? You're not that special. You're not that good. Proud of yourself and your little carriage rescue, are you? Well, I didn't need your help. I'm a top level student on my finishing assignment ordered to retrieve free, useless children. Pillover's voice emanated from behind his home. I hardly think that was all. Of course it wasn't all. I had the p prototype to collect as well, now didn't I? Pillover took interest at last. The one the flyway men were after? What's it a prototype of? Don't be daft. I don't know that. Do you think you might at some point tell me what finishing actually means? Sophronia was actually getting more and more curious about the particulars of this finishing school. It seemed Mumsy might have been misled to the as to the nature of the establishment. No. When it gave her a decidedly nasty glare, then turned her attention out the carriage window. Sophronia wasn't certain what she'd done to incur such loathing. Should have left her with the flyway men. She looked at Pillover, who ignored her, so she sighed and sat back, frustrated. After a moment's consideration, she switched to the spot next to Pillover and attempted to read over his shoulder, ignoring his faintly goaded s smell. All boys smelled of goats, so they passed the rest of the ride until the carriage pulled into the sleepy little town of Swiffelonex. As they rattled to a halt, Dimity blinked. Uh, awake ow what did i fall asleep no you fainted blood explained her brother tersely oh did i pardon dimity glanced on at her winded shoulder oh her eyes began to roll back in her head uh, sophronia quickly leaned forward and clapped a hand over the injury none of that now Dimity refocused on her ouch perhaps we could tie something over it good plan close your eyes Sophronia worked the long hair ribbon loose from the grip 
rail inside the carriage door and wrapped it around Dimity's shoulders. Oh, I do wish we were I were more like m mummy. She's terribly fearsome. I wish I m looked more like her as well. That would help with everything Dimity sat up. Why? What does she look like? More like Pillover than me. Sophronia, who had been seen very little of Pillover's appearance outside of his massive outer garments, could only say, oh. You know, dark and brooding. I should dearly love to be dark and brooding. It's so romantic and fortune-teller. Like, I couldn't brood if my life depended on it. Well, the ribbon around her shoulder makes for a certain fortune-telling appeal. Oh, does it? Splendid. You know, Sophronia, you could probably do it if you put your mind to it. Do what? Be dark and brooding. Sophronia, with middling brown hair and moderate green eyes, set in a freckled face, would hardly have described herself as brooding, or dark for that matter. Dimity's attention, lightning fast, shifted to a new topic. Where are we? Bunsen's finally, said Pillover, snapping his book shut. He made a show of organizing for arrival. Given that he no longer had any luggage, this was rather like the action of a mechanical without instructions trundling idly in circus until he ran out of steam. The carriage door was opened by a stiff domestic mechanical of some advanced outdoor nature. What is that, gr Gaps? Sophronia, she had never seen anything to equal the monstrosity. It was taller than Frau Bertrand, and conically shaped with a wheelbarrow attached to its back, where a face facsimil should be was a confusion of gears and cogs like the back of a clock. Porter Mechanical Pillover stood, clutching his literary tome, and jumped down. You two coming, he asked without turning to see. Where is your luggage, young sir? asked the mechanical. Its voice loud, was louder and brassier than Frau Butcher's. It wore a gray cap backward and a brass octopus pin on a cloth cravat around its neck. That's too bizarre. Sophronia had never seen a mechanical wear clothing before. Pillover answered, oh, about ten miles back in the middle of the road, sir. The porter rocked side to side in confusion. It was riding a set of rails like a very small train. Sophronia climbed out of the carriage to get a closer look, wondering if she could take the porter apart. So Dimity followed. The mechanical's attention instantly shifted to them. No females, young sir. It made a whirring, hissing noise and ejected a puff of steam from below its cravat. The material fluttered up against its clockwork f face, then flopped back down. Pillover turned back. What? No females allowed, young sir. The porter puffed again. Flap, flap, went the, went the cravat. Oh, those aren't females. They're only girls. They're slated for the finishing academy. They read as females, young sir. Oh, I say, don't be difficult. Sophronia took the diplomatic route. We need to speak with an authority. Our carriage was attacked and our guardian is overset. No females. The porter mechanic was quite firm on this. Its chest panel moved aside to reveal some kind of weapon, too large to be a gun. Sophronia stood transfixed. It sparked and then whooshed to life, hurling blue flames that got close enough to singe Dimity's hair. The girls drove back inside the cab, and the coachman, who was not having any more tomfoolery on his watch, drove the carriage away at once. The flaming porter did not follow them. The carriage halted outside the school grounds, but Sophronia placed her nose against the glass above the cab door and looked. Bunsen's with massive but oddly hodgepodge, not like a respectable educational facility at all. A few of its towers were square, but the others were round, some were old, others new, and some were positively foreign-looking. There were wires stretching between the towers and sticks, jutting outside with netting uh, dangling off their ends. Uh, an orange glow lit up various windows here and there, and puffs of steam emanated forth, and one large smokestack belched plumes of black smoke up into the sky. Sophronia looked at Dimity. What now? Well, my brother's no good. He'll have forgotten about us the moment he got inside. It's starting to get dark. Sophronia turned to their erstwhile headmistress. She'll, she's simply going to have to do her job. 
Dimity took a deep breath, sat down on a bench next to Monique, and shook the older girls form. What do you want? We don't know the Academy's location, and neither does the driver. Monique de Palouse said nothing. Sophronia crossed her arms and glared at the older girl. Dimity looked back and forth between the two girls for a moment, then crossed her arms and glared as well, though perhaps not quite so fiercely. Finally, Monique relented. Oh, very well. She banged on the roof of her parasol handle. The door opened and the coachman stuck his head in. Take Shrubbery Lane to the Nib and Crinkle pub. Turn left and follow the goat path behind the hedge. After an hour, the path ends in a thicket of trees go go around to the right and then i shall issue further instructions and hurry we must beat the sunset or we'll never spot it but madam that's straight out onto the moor of course it is what could possibly have made you think we'd stop at the edge there are stories about dartmoor people get lost in the mist and never return or or are eaten by werewolves or are taken by vampires or are murdered by flyaway men at which juncture Monique proved she could do commanding far better than Sophronia. Stop arguing, my man. You heard what I said about the sun. Looking very uncomfortable, the put-upon coachman resumed his place. The tired horses started up at once. At first, everything seemed ordinary, but a few minutes up the goat path, the carriage started to sway, buffeting by the most intense gusts of wind Sophronia had ever felt. She pressed her face against the window, endlessly rolling grassland, stretching around them, brown after a summer's heat waving in the wind. The moor was mistrotted in the distance, here and there a coppice of trees or a small winding spring disturbed the monotony of a bright splash of green. Is this all? Sophronia was dubious. Dimity shrugged. Wendy, don't let it fool you, Monique said with an unkind smile. This is a the only nice bit. Soon enough, the rocks will sprout up like broken bones, and the mist rises so fast you can't see where you're going or where you've been. Sophronia was knocked, spooked. You think you can scare me with doomy talk? I've older sisters, I'll have you know. Monique gave her a dirty look before rapping on the carriage roof again and issuing a new set of directions. The carriage turned, this time following some invisible path out onto the heath. The mist began closing in around them, or they were moving into it, hard to tell which. Sophronia actually began to feel a tiny bit of dread with in the pit of her stomach. And what if there really are werewolves roaming the moors? And then there it was. The mist broke. The last ray of the sun cast a long shadow out the carriage and lit up Mademoiselle Geraldine's finishing academy for young ladies of quality. And no, the school wasn't dashing around the moor on hundreds of tiny little legs. It was bobbing above it in chubby, floating majesty fuss and chap. Chapter 3 of uh, Etiquette and Espionage by Gail Carriger.